Senator Denton in Texas for our uh, outreach speaker this evening. And uh, let's welcome Chad. How are you, Chad? Hey, good evening. How's it going? We're doing fine here. And I'm, I just can't wait to hear your message this evening. And uh, Lord, we just pray a blessing over Chad as he delivers this message from you this evening. Uh, there are ears that need to hear, ears that need to have hope, yes, Lord. And ears that need to have peace, ears that need to hear comfort. And we pray all of those things over Chad as he delivers uh, your word to us this evening. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Chad. Amen. Thank, thank you very much. Ladies, thank y'all all very, very much. Leslie, you did a wonderful job tonight. Enjoyed that. Carrie, I actually took some notes from uh, what you ministered about and uh, enjoyed that very much. And of course, uh, Cassie and Brittany, very good. Um, we enjoy Regina, who plays with them, and uh, get to play with Regina quite often. And she's an extremely talented musician and have enjoyed writing a couple of songs with her and my wife. Um, again, Red, thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. Looking forward to sharing a word with you guys and uh, just praying that we all take this in and allow God just to infiltrate our spirit and our soul and really just work in us tonight. It may be late night where you're at. It may be early morning where you're at. And uh, just to let, taking this time, as Hank was saying, just to spend some time with Jesus is awesome. I got my Jesus shirt on tonight. And uh, we were talking about that a little bit before we got started. I've got a long joke or a little bit of a funny thing. My granddad has been a pastor for uh, 54 years. He retired and went semi about two years ago. My mother took over our church uh, as the senior pastor. But he always had a joke and he always told me, I'd ask him, Grandpa, what are you going to preach about? And he'd say, Jesus. He uh, one time went to a conference to speak and got up and got to telling some guys before the uh, service what was going to uh, he was going to be preaching about that night. And guess what? Those four guys preached his sermon before he ever got up there. So he learned real quick to uh, hold that sermon tightly until it was time to deliver. Tonight, I'm hoping that I can also deliver the same and just be a vessel, like I said here. I'd just like to pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, God, again, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for these ladies. We're looking for the, ne for the next songs to come up after me. And Lord, just guide our hearts, our minds, and this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight's message, uh, Damascus Journey. Who's been on a Damascus journey? I, I know many times in my life I've, I've felt like I was on a, a Damascus journey, and, and maybe it was a portion of a journey getting me to this new change or this new person, this new being uh, in Christ. And, and a lot of times those times take time. Um, sometimes we don't understand when we look back in our past, why did we go through those things? Why did those things happen to us? Why did I act that way? Um, there's a lot of questions that go there, but God is building us up and getting us to the point that uh, we can do the things that we need to do for him as a servant of him. So I'm going to talk tonight mainly in Acts chapter 9. So if you've got your Bible, if you want to follow along, you're going to be reading through Acts chapter 9. Talking about music, I'm a huge music fan. Um, love the song Life is a Highway. And uh, life is definitely a highway. It's a journey. And Saul found out where his life was and where his life was going on the Damascus Road. And so tonight, I'm going to start reading um, the first verse in Acts chapter uh, 9. It goes like this. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. You can obviously tell at this point, it was time for a change in Saul. Saul's heart had began to get hardened. For some reason, there was something deeply rooted in him that he despised Christians and what Christ stood for. If you look in today's wor in world where we live, how many times do you see it? Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's when you're on the road. Um, maybe it's in your household. 
there's a lot of places that there's a lot of people that just despise good. And what's the word say? And the end days that the that good will become evil and evil will become good. That's what we're seeing more and more uh, through the years as, as we start to get closer to the Lord's return. His word is going to become true. Um, over the years, I've owned several businesses. Um, the last couple of years, up until December of this last year, I was building custom homes. Prior to that, I had a welding shop for many years. And over those years, I got to meet a lot of great people. And I met a lot of ungrate people. It, it, some of y'all probably laugh because you might can think of that one person you thought, well, I could have had a different experience with that. Through those experiences, there were times that it hurt me. It hurt my heart because my whole heart was into what I was doing and I was trying really hard and I was giving it all that I had. And I felt like that other person would see that. And uh, they would do something that was hurtful or say something that was hurtful. And it began to get to this point where you get a little callous and you get to where you can kind of take it and you kind of can push it off and deal with the moment and move on. And then there comes this time, if we're not careful, that we get so just completely hardened that our heart is like a stone. And um, you start to think about that and look back on your life and see those moments where that heart that heart may have went from something very soft and tender where the holy spirit could work where the lord was really speaking to you moving and then all of a sudden you're you're kind of not hearing the holy spirit speak to you the way that you used to have maybe had um maybe you're in a spot you're saying chad what's it like to have the holy spirit speak to me the very best way to get that communication line going is to start chipping away that solid stone that gets built around that heart, that callus that gets there, that builds up, that makes it so hard for us to really communicate with God. Just like tonight, these great songs, the communication in worship music and being able to commute our, communicate our love to him. Saul needed that. But Saul was fighting because Satan had put something in him at such a root of hate. For Christ, he was going out to kill every man and woman that had anything to do with the way. And so reading on in verse ch after uh, chapter nine, verse three, it says, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly, suddenly get this, a light from heaven flashed around. This right here is the entrance of Christ. Christ came to Saul. You say, man, somebody so bad, so evil, so, that has such sadistic thinking. Why would he go to him? Because that he is what he loves. He wants that opportunity to say, hey, I love you. You can do whatever you can to push me away. I'm going to keep loving you. Christ still loves you. No matter where you're at tonight, no matter what pain you're feeling, um, maybe the things that happened this week or that's been going on in your life, Christ loves you. There's not a thing you can do that's going to push him away. He is going to continue until the day that he returns to keep reaching in and reaching in and trying to grab that heart and say, hey, I'm here. Give it to me. Give me everything that you've got going on in your life. I think about the people and the lives that would have been saved by Saul's hand if he would have gave over many years before that and really gave to, to into God. So God said, hey, I got to show up. He showed up on the road to Damascus in a great light and it flashed around. And in that, Carrie, when you were singing and you were given a, a little uh, demonstration of the closeness of heaven and earth, and, and you showed your hand, you said, earth is here and, and, and heaven's here. And just this lightning, come, just a, a great example. I think so many times we see this huge chasm between here we are on earth and heaven somewhere way up here and we're trying to hope that the connection's getting to God and maybe we've got a good connection. Red was talking about uh, getting his new internet connection coming in and you know there's this connection that we're looking for and we don't realize we are that close to heaven. The words we're speaking, the things we're doing, the Holy Spirit is here. The Lord is here with us tonight. It's not like he's a hundred million miles away looking at us. He's right here with us. And in that moment, 
he was right there with Saul. It says um, in verse four, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul looks back and return. He's replying. He's hearing this voice. He's seeing this bright light. The men with him can even see what's going on. He says, who are you, Lord? It says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city. You will be told what you must do. There's this time in transition. You, you may be new to the Lord, or maybe you've just repented and come back to the Lord. There's some transition that happens. So many things in our life we want to happen instantly. I can hit the button real quick on here, and instantly it's muted. I can instantly hit it, and the, there goes the video. I can turn it right back on. It's instant. We're so used to instant gratification that we don't understand sometimes God has a way of doing things. Could God in that moment on that road just boom, everything is how he wanted Saul to be, and he changes to Paul, and he goes on about this great ministry? Yeah, he could have. But he had to do some things, some steps. There were some processes to get where he needed to be. And so he gives Saul this command. So it says the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see nothing. He could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And tonight my message is really focused around verses eight and nine. Again, it says Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. Well, I saw the light. Hank Williams, come on, we've got all the musicians here tonight. Let's talk about some music, right? Hank Williams wrote, I saw the light. We think that as soon as we see Christ, that boom, we come down, we say, God, I give you my heart. I repent. I'm asking for your forgiveness. And instantaneously, and we're going, we have this good feeling. The Holy Spirit's there. We got the tinglys. But Monday comes, Tuesday comes, Wednesday comes. Life's still there. And we're like, God, are you, are you working with me? Sometimes it may even be a few weeks. Man, you're, you're on this high, and you're really feeling good. And you're excited about your new walk. And, and, and it's just like, where's the true light? What am I trying to see? It's because we've got to dig in. There's a process to truly giving it all to God. Anything you do, the, the instruments that were played here tonight, it took time and effort. And there was a process. And each chord didn't sound as good as they sounded tonight the first time they played them. The first time you did something that you love, maybe it's a hobby or your job. It, it took some time and a process. There was a process in Saul's life in his changing. It says in 10, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. He said, Ananias. And Ananias answered back, yes, Lord. There are some of you out there tonight that God is going to use you as an Ananias. Maybe you're watching and you've been tuned in the Reds room and you see the great things that so many people are getting to do to share the word of God and to share it through their music and through word. And you're like, I, I really kind of want to do that. But how do I do that? Reach out. Take the opportunities. Get the opportunities God lays before you and go get it. Because you may be Ananias. You may be that person that God says, you're my vessel for this time for this person. But a lot of times, we kind of get like Ananias when God calls us. You see, even though Ananias was quick to answer the Lord, he said, yes, Lord. When God gave him the mission, he was kind of like, ooh, I don't know about that. He said, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on the straight street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. I want you to think about this. Saul was going to kill Christians. He was on a mission, had his men. He was ready to go. It was like the expendables headed out. The light from heaven hits him, puts him on the ground. They hear this voice. It is such a momentous thing. Uh, just such a moment in time in, in Saul's life. It's went from him not 
having any relationship to he is praying and seeking God's face and knowledge, saying, I'm blind. I can't see. I've been led to this house. Ananias doesn't realize this, that there's already been a process going on. God's already been molding and working. It says in a vision, he has he seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. You see, he had already seen what God was going to do. Sometimes we don't understand. Somebody may come to you and say, man, that, that was like deja vu. That, that's weird. It's like I experienced that at one point in time. Maybe God gave it in a dream in a vision, maybe put it in somebody's heart that something was coming. They were praying. They were believing. They were saying, there is change coming. I can feel it. I know it. I want it so badly. Saul wanted change. He didn't like going from this strong, powerful warrior man to basically helpless, sitting in a home blind. So he's calling out. He's praying. And then it says, Lord, Aaron and I, and I answered, I've heard many reports about this man, all the harm he has done to the to your people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. He wanted to arrest them, kill them, get rid of them. He was tired of this, the way. There was something that had hurt him that had got him to the point. He said, mm -mm, I, I, I'm not messing with those people. I'm going to really just get rid of them so that my life can be changed. He didn't realize God said, oh, just wait, go on what's your plan because I'm fixing to tap on your shoulder and your life's fixing to change. You see, though, Ananias had that but God moment. But God, you know, I really want to do this. God, I'm really for you. God, I feel the calling for you. But God, I, I just don't know. God, I, I just don't know how, how financially that's going to work. Or God, I, I know you're wanting me to do that. I, I just don't know about the time that it's going to take. We've got to put time and money and effort and all the things that deal with life in God's hands and say, God, I'm just the vessel. Take me there. I've said since I was a small child, I said, if God calls me tomorrow to go and preach in Africa, I'll get on a plane and go tomorrow. I, I truly have seen the things that God has done in my life. And when I was completely and just open to him, my heart was soft. I, I was let go of the callous. I let go of the hardness and said, Holy Spirit, guide and lead me. He made a way. He will make a way for you tonight. He has a way for you. What you've been praying about, we're going to pray about it at the end of this. I promise you, if you will stick to it and allow God to work and go through his process, trust the process, right? It's like painting. I've talked about that many times in my sermons. You can try to paint something or stain a piece of wood and it tells you a certain way to do it. And if you don't follow those steps and directions, it's not going to come out like you're hoping, like the example that you see maybe at the store. You've got to go through the process, so you've got Saul going through a process and you've got Ananias going through a process, but they're both coming together. It says, but the Lord said to Ananias, get this. I want you to highlight this, mark this. This is verse 15 again. But the Lord said to Ananias, two letter word, go. You're saying, Chad, how can I get this started? How can I do what God's called me to do? How can I be a vessel for him? Go. Go. That's the first thing you got to do. That's the key to getting any journey started is to go. Simply move. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. God had somebody that was so out for against his people. And he said, oh, but wait, this man's seen one side. I've allowed him to see this for a little bit so that he's going to have an opportunity to minister to my people. And not only my people that are the laymen, the, the people out there working, the people in the community, he's going to reach the kings, the leadership. Said, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I imagine Saul had some moments in that house, walking there, getting there, praying all those days, 
saying, Lord, I, I'm sorry. Uh, forgive me. Do what you need to do. Come into my life. He didn't realize God had this worked out. God's got what you're praying about worked out. I, I, I will tell you right now, the one thing you're going to learn about me, I'm real. I, I, I don't want to be fluffy. I don't want to be, I want to be real when I preach. I can give you personal things. You want to PM me on our ministry page, Ignited Cowboy Revival, check it out. Send me a message. I'll share my personal testimony with you. I have seen the valley, the darkest of the dark, but I've seen God show up. And that's what he did. I've seen God touch my life and others' life in such a dramatic way. There was a change. To everybody else, it seemed like it was an overnight success, right? So many times we just, we, we see these people on TV and they, no matter if they're in the movies or seeing this song, they're an overnight success. They're young. Look at them. Little did people know they started when they were three, four, five years old singing. They started at seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old getting acting lessons. They just didn't happen at 21, 22 years old to start making millions of dollars and find all this fame and success. There was a process that others didn't see. You see, there's a process been going on and your miracles on its way. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it again, saying, placing his hands on Saul. There you go. Be willing. If you're Ananias, to go do the work and go do it and lay your hands on whoever God tells you to and do what God's told you to do. Don't go beyond it. Don't allow your flesh to say, I'm going to make a show of this or I'm going to just do what God specifically tells you to do. No more, no less. When we do that, we stay in his perfect will. It says on down though in 18, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again, he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. It is commonly thought that God renamed Saul after his conversion, right? I mean, we, we, we hear Saul and Paul, we see things go on. But Saul indicates and talks about, and what we put in is the persecutor, Saul the persecutor. While Paul refers to a change a changed Christian man. However, I read this and I, and I found this interesting. However, in Acts 9, 17, Ananias refers to him as Saul after his conversion. Later in Acts 13, 2, the Holy Spirit addresses him as Saul before he sets off on his first missionary trip. Just hang with me. We're talking about working with the process. You see, it wasn't an instantaneous thing. He wasn't an overnight success. God had to do a few things. In fact, he was referred to as Saul 11 times after his conversion. It is when he sets out, what do you do? Two-letter word, go. Saul had to go. It is when he sets out from Jerusalem, for, from Jerusalem in Acts 13, 13, that the gospel author Luke begins to refer to him as Paul, which is in fact the Greek version of Hebrew, the Hebrew name Saul. I struggled a lot with, I like who I am. I'm comfortable with who I am, right? I've been a preacher's kid all my life. I've been in church. I've, I've went through the phases of being in church and my Christian walk. And I've turned away from God. There was a time, a three-year span, I completely walked out of the church that I grew up in and didn't return for three years. They completely had done a remodel, and I was surprised when I got there and seen the walls were painted. We didn't have that cool brown paneling anymore. But you see, I'd gotten into a place where I was done with it. I was like, Saul, I'm done with these people. I, I, I'm tired. I've been hurt. But didn't you know what I found out? Everywhere I went, there were people that were going to hurt me. It wasn't God out to hurt me. I'll never forget this. I was going through that three-year time span. and I was still a youth pastor at another church during that time. I uh, had played in a Christian rock band, and we were going to places and playing and 
having a good time, but my heart, my mind just wasn't where I needed to be. And I was at work one day and at the time I hauled heavy equipment and I was loading a piece of heavy equipment on a trailer and I was in my early twenties and the shop foreman walks out. I'm sitting on this tractor and I looked down at him and I said, what's up, Greg? And he, he just simply looked at me and he said, you can't run. He turns around and walks off. All the man said to me, you can't run. I took, I walked back in there later that afternoon and I said, I looked at him and he goes, you know what I was talking about, don't you? We can't run. You see, God has a purpose for you, for us, for you, for me. He had a purpose for Saul. No matter how hard Saul wanted to run, he couldn't get away from him. I want to encourage you tonight in closing to just say, God, I'm going to give it all to you. I'm going to trust the process. This may not be changing just like I wanted it to change, or it may not, this conversion in my heart may not be happening the way that I thought it was, but God, I'm just going to say, Holy Spirit, guide me. Holy Spirit, be my comforter. Ease that anxiety, ease that depression, ease those things that try to creep in from the outside to change our way of thinking. It says you're going to be a new person in a new way with a new mind. Embrace the fact that you're going to have a new way of doing things. In closing, I want to thank again, Red, for allowing me to be here tonight and get to talk and, and to minister with you guys. I've enjoyed it a tremendous amount. And I'd just like to close real quick in, in prayer with everyone tonight. If you would, if you've got anything that's on your heart tonight, I know a God that can. I know a God that can change it all. That that process, you may not even have known it, has been happening in the background. And in the morning, you've got to change. Your God, our God, knows what you need. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you tonight. We praise you again for this word, this message. We thank you for what guidance you've given us. And I ask that, Father God, tonight that you're just going to walk into the lives of each and every person. And Father God, strengthen them. Uplift and guide them, Father God. Lord God, when their hearts are weary, when, the, when they feel like they're not making the progress that they want to make, let them know, Father God, you're doing all right. You're going right in the right direction I need you to go. Father God, allow us to hold on to that two-letter word, go. Allow us not to become stagnant, but to go when we're called by you. Father God, no matter what we know, what we've got to face, just like Ananias knew that he had to go face Saul. Allow us to have the strength to know that, Father God, you're with us. You've already got everything worked out in the way that it needs to be worked out. We ask for courage and strength for each of those that are out there tonight. Father God, those that need a healing, that need a touch, we ask to be done. Those that need a financial miracle, we ask that it be done. Father God, those others that have something that's so dear to their heart, Father God, allow it not to harden their heart, but Father God, that it strengthen them. Father God, they're going to know that you're in control. Allow him to give it over to you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, I appreciate the opportunity tonight and truly have enjoyed this. And I hope I get another opportunity to do it again. I'm sure you will. Thank you so much, Chad, for your beautiful message. And uh, one of the things that sprung to my mind was that uh, God never calls the equipped. He equips the called. Amen. And, uh, when it's our time to go, we will have everything that we need if we sure. trust him and go in his name. Thank you so much, Chad, as we bid farewell to you in Texas, thanking you for your wonderful words. And we'll pray over you if we lift our hands to our Heavenly Father, Lord in heaven, Holy Spirit, uh, our, our friend and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we pray that you will bless this man. Bless his words. Bless him richly in your love and in your wisdom that he may continue to preach your word, your solid word, your unwavering word to those that need to hear it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Chad. Uh, farewell to you until we meet again.